Hello and good afternoon, everyone. We are expecting almost 2,000 participants today. And so we first just want to welcome all of you for being here. We know this is a huge topic on everyone's mind. Um, and we're excited that you can be here um, not only to listen to um, Dr. Greg Merwin and Josh Hill discuss the reopening plan and recommendations, but then also for us to answer some of your questions today. Um, if you do have questions, please put them below in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And um, we will try to answer many of them either live or as we type them in the screen this afternoon, but we'll be capturing all of them. We're putting together a much more comprehensive FAQ that we can put out online and send to parents um, and to teachers and staff to help with all of the questions that you all have. So as we get started, I first just wanna make a few quick introductions. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the district, Ryan Burris. We have our Superintendent Kirsten Vital with us today. We have our Deputy Superintendent Clark Hapton who oversees business services finance, IT, custodial, m and nutrition, and the list goes on and on. We have Dr. Greg Merwin with us who oversees support services, Tim Brooks who oversees human resource services, Susan Holliday who oversees education services, and Josh Hill with us who is our secondary leader for um, an assistant superintendent for secondary. Um, I want to turn it over first to Superintendent Kirsten Vital to say a few words, and then I will um, quickly just tell you just a few ground rules before we get started. So good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. We so appreciate the partnership and the feedback as we unveil our initial planning. Um, our goal is to have a finalized plan by July 15th to let the board then um, take it for a recommendation and approval then. Um, we know there are lots of questions and lots to work out and that every site is going to be very different. Some sites have a lot of facilities, other sites do not. Um, and so there are still, I know, so many questions, but I think in asking the questions and having the conversation and thinking through, and we had the privilege yesterday of having, I think over 900 teachers, staff and administrators on a call and getting their questions and sort of thinking about some of this planning is only gonna make us better, as I've said before. The only way we're gonna figure this out is figuring out together. Um, and so again, we appreciate you being here and appreciate your questions. Um, and this too, we will figure out together. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Greg and to Josh to kind of walk us through the current thinking and the initial plan. Well, let me just say just a few quick things real quick, Superintendent, just so people understand what we're gonna do. Um, we did get a lot of questions from families just how this all works. And so um, what you'll see tomorrow night at the board meeting is exactly what you saw on in the agenda, item 32 of the, or 33 of the agenda. So the board will have a list of options in front of them. The staff has made recommendations on option three, and those are the ones that Greg and Josh will discuss today and we will answer questions about. The board ultimately votes and we expect tomorrow that they will give guidance to us in order to formalize a plan that we will bring back to the board on, um, in July, July 15th. Um, the purpose of the, of, of the recommendations and the guidance from the board tomorrow and then finalizing a plan and doing all this work we've done up until this point was to gather feedback from families and from teachers and staff and really put a plan together that works for everyone. That was a value of the board and the district. And that's why these discussions continue and why it's so important that we do this work even tomorrow night and that we continue to hear from our families. One thing that we will not be talking about in any great detail probably up until August is the, is the plans for health and safety guidelines for opening school. Um, I did, I did um, link this document, it's the schools and, um, and school-based programs document from the California Department of Public Health. I sent this leak out to families last Friday I recommend that all of you read it because this is what we're using to sort of plan out what the school year looks like at this point. But so much changes every day that we don't really know and we wouldn't really be able to say what recess will exactly look like or lunch or any of the other things that would be in some of these health and safety guidelines. But we have to plan accordingly. So this is the guiding document for us. 
and um, we we are not sure whether to expect a guiding document from the County of Orange at this point. So this will continue to be until something more local comes out. We will take a look at both documents and still come up with a standard that we think is, is good for our district. But for now, it's this document. So please um, review it in, um, in your free time. And with that, I will turn it over to Greg and to Josh. Thank you very much, Ryan and Superintendent Vital. It's our pleasure to be here with all of you today uh, to share this uh, reopening schools plan. Uh, we will be uh, using the PowerPoint presentation that uh, was already submitted uh, with the board report Friday evening, um, and it will be the it will be the PowerPoint that is utilized on Wednesday evening. So we're actually going to use that to kind of guide our conversation today. We will be talking about the plan and, it, and the four key components of the plan. Uh, we will be focusing on the community values that are foundational to the development of this plan that uh, help us stay true to what, to what our mission is. Uh, we will be sharing a timeline. Ryan has already given you a preview of that. Uh, and so we will walk you through that. And this is a, a preview of the uh, board meeting tomorrow night. I uh, also want to, before we even get to that point, we want to frame the, uh, the, the uh, con give context and frame this plan, this reopening schools plan, uh, using two very important um, issues or framework, if you will. The first one is the budget, and the second one is the, uh, uh, the uh, Department of Public Health guidelines, as Ryan's already uh, shared with you. First and foremost, um, many of you have heard and you've seen in communication from the district office uh, that we are facing a significant budget crisis uh, as a state and our district is uh, going to be facing those same budget, budgetary limitations and a significant impact as well. It's either we, the um, final budget is still being um, negotiated, if you will, at the state level between legislature and the governor. And the, um, so we don't have a final budget yet. We don't know uh, exactly what we're looking at, but we do know that significant, significant limitations are coming and significant reductions are, are on the horizon. With that in mind, with those constraints, we know that we have to use current staffing and current resources to the greatest ability possible. To the greatest extent possible, we have to look at our current staffing and resources instead of adding additional staffing and resources. So that is a, that's a frame that we need to be aware of as we look at this reopening plan together. And also, as Ryan has already shared with you, the guidelines from the California Department of Public Health truly do uh, define our, our boundaries, if you will, and what's possible. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I'm gonna bring up the PowerPoint. And, uh, and walk you through. And uh, Mr. Josh Hill, the Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Schools is with me here as well. And he and I will both be uh, uh, explaining different parts of this to you. And then also the rest of the team here uh, may be jumping in as well from time to time to, uh, to help answer your questions. So here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and bring up the Reopening Schools Plan PowerPoint. And on your screen, you should be able to see the four components of the reopening plan. As you can see, component number one, safety and well-being standards for students and employees. Component number two, curriculum and instruction. Component number three, mental health and emotional support, emotional, social emotional learning and cultural diversity. And component four, the learning models. Uh, how do we, to the greatest extent possible, get people back, get our students and our staff back on campus? As I had already mentioned to you, the foundational to this work are core values. The core values of our, um, our community, which uh, is rich in its diversity and its uh, different communities and cities and cultures. And so there are universal themes and universal values that uh, cross our 200 square miles of district that we share and we hold uh, dear to us. These core values are in the board report uh, and listed. There are many more than, than are on this slide. But as you can see on this slide, it gives you an idea 
of these values that drove the work and are foundational to this plan. They are in two major themes. The first theme is really safety and connectedness. And the second theme, learning. You'll notice that in the board report for all of these values and then um, listed here on this slide, they are from the perspective of a student. We are all here for our students. They are our highest priority to support our students and, and help them be successful. And so they are all from a student's perspective. And so you can see in the safety and connectedness, give, given the fact that we have all faced incredible challenges over the last three plus months uh, with isolation and uh, with not being able to come to our school campuses and just a disruption in what life is for us, we know these core values start first and foremost with students want to feel connected to their school. They want to feel a sense of connectedness that they've lost because they have been uh, it, uh, under stay at home orders and at home doing distance learning. We also want them to feel a sense of returning to normal. That, that sense of normalcy to the greatest extent possible is critical to our students, our families and our staff. Knowing that when we return, normal is in quotes for a reason. And it's because there we can't come back to absolutely what it was like prior to COVID-19 based on the health and safety guidelines from the Department of Public Health um, regarding COVID-19. But we can hold this value true and come back and return to normal and provide normal to the greatest extent possible. We also know students benefit from social interaction. They benefit from interacting with their peers. They benefit from, act, from interacting with their teachers. You'll note there are other uh, values under this theme as well, but these are really key ones that we wanna bring your attention to. And then we know for learning, we know that our students deserve, whether they're online or on campus, a rigorous, engaging, consistent educational experience, whether they're online or on campus. And they deserve that and they, uh, they need that. We also recognize from an equitable lens that some students need more support than others. And so that next bullet really gets to that, to say that some, some students benefit, all students benefit from being on campus, but some benefit, are more successful working independently in an online setting and others need additional support. Students with disabilities, our juniors and seniors that are working on career college and career pathways uh, towards their um, later years of, of high school. Uh, our youngest students, our kindergartners, our first graders, our second graders learning how to read. We understand that, that from an equity lens that, that everyone, every student doesn't need the exact same. So that is a value that is in this plan, understanding that students all benefit, uh, need different types of support and certain groups need uh, more support than others. And then finally, that students do value those extracurricular activities of the sports, clubs, fine arts, school events, uh, opportunities beyond classes. So not only is, um, do, will you see in this plan a focus on the fundamentals, uh, getting back to, you know, making sure we are, we are very focused in our teaching and our learning on the most critical uh, essential standards that students need to master, but also understanding that they value these other opportunities as well. And as a parent of two students that play clubs, uh, two children that play club soccer, I get it very much just the way you do. Val students value those types of activities. So moving on to component number one, and very important to, uh, to point out to you here is we, we've, had, we've had many questions about the idea of guidelines. And so, okay, you have guidelines from the state, the Department of Public Health. Um, well, are guidelines something that you have options with? And quite honestly, we are a public entity. And as a public entity, we are required to have a standard care, a standard of care for our students and for our staff. And for that reason, we, that standard of care is, is uh, provided to us by the California Department of Public Health and by the Orange County Healthcare Agency. Those are our two um, public healthcare entities that guide, that provide us the standard. And we hear questions about, well, what about the World Health Organization? What about 
the CDC, the Federal uh, Center for Disease Control. And while we are aware of those, these are our standard of care. It's the California Department of Public Health and the Orange County Healthcare Agency. That being said, the California Department of Public Health, as Ryan Burris has already shared with you, has a guidelines released on June 5th, and those are defining our health and safety measures as bulleted below. Those are all defined in that document. We are still waiting for guidance from our county. So in absence of guidance from our county, we are uh, our only standard of care is the Department of Public Health. If the county comes out with guidance, then we would definitely be uh, including that as our standard of care as well. And you can see in these bullets below and described in the, uh, in the board report, all of these will be defined by California Department of Public Health in the guidelines document that Ryan Burris has already shared with you in his email from late last week. Component number two, curriculum and instruction. Community values that drive the work behind component number two, the community values consistency, so that you have a consistent high level of education across teachers, grade levels, schools, across the district. Rigor, we, have, we as a district have a reputation of an outstanding, um, um, educational rigorous experience for our students. Engagement that whether it's online or on campus, it is very engaging for our students. Flexibility, the ability to be flexible so that if we have to, if a student um, is ill and needs to be home, then the student can be home still benefiting from an outstanding curriculum from home. If a, if a student or a family uh, for different health reasons asks or requests to be home, that student can benefit just as much as the students that are on campus in front of their teacher. The flexibility that, as you'll notice in the Department of Public Health guidelines, there are criteria for when we, we work with the county to actually consider short-term closures of schools or students staying home for quarantine. Those are all, that flexibility must be there for our curriculum and instruction so that learning is not lost and that outstanding curriculum and outstanding instruction continues. Clarity, so that families are very clear. There's, there's a, a very clear system on how to uh, access for students and for, for families, and also clear for teachers and for administrators on their part, clarity on how to, um, where everything is, how messaging is delivered through the curriculum and instruction, and that there's that clarity of communication. And then finally, uh, effectiveness, of course, that it's an effective, an effective curriculum and instruction that improves student outcomes. So as you'll notice in the board report that we have uh, several teams, two different teams of, uh, of a diverse group of district staff working on uh, reopening. One is called the reopening lead team, and the other is the reopening logistics team. And both teams are well represented by every single stakeholder or uh, viewpoint or um, district position on each, on each of those teams. We have uh, teacher representatives, we have different uh, classified positions. So for example, custodial and uh, office support and uh, paraeducators, et cetera. So all different positions, all different uh, management from all the different departments looking at, at the issues together. And so the reopening lead team is currently working uh, very, very closely on different options for the curriculum instruction component of the reopening plan to deliver on these values with the idea that we will deliver on the values that you see here and that are listed in the board, board report, but there are, there are a couple of different options as how we might get there. So you can see the options there. One is to uh, bring in a new learning management system called Canvas, which is used by other organizations uh, other learning uh, educational organizations, higher ed and K-12. And then within that, that our district teams, teams of teachers would develop their own online curriculum 
inside of that management system. Um, learning from the issues from distance learning, learning from the, the examples of successes, but also the many challenges that we all experience during distance learning. And so the district team is talking about how could they could develop their own online curriculum. The other option that's being uh, uh, reviewed and considered is purchasing uh, a pre-built curriculum, such as Florida Virtual is one curriculum that is available and Apex Learning is another curriculum. Those curriculums are currently being used uh, in our different, um, in our Cal Prep and um, Capo, Capo Virtual programs. And so we have experience with those, just not on a large scale. So those are things that our reopening team is wrestling with and coming to figuring, figuring out. And we are excited to bring to the board a recommendation at the June 24th board meeting. You also notice in component, component number two in the, uh, in the board report, it, it discusses a focus on fundamentals and core curriculum. Understanding that some of our students regressed over during, um, during distance learning, that there might have been lost learning, we want to be able to focus on those essential standards, those fundamentals of numeracy and literacy, and those core curriculum in the secondary, and uh, make sure that we, we reinforce those foundational needs for our kids. But above and beyond that, to assess quickly our students, to understand where they are, what do they need, uh, do they need interventions, whether or not they are um, only general education or general education with an IEP uh, and special education services, that we assess them early, we intervene appropriately, and we provide opportunities. We provide those additional opportunities as I previewed at the beginning regarding uh, for our juniors and our seniors and also for students that uh, may need additional support. Component number three is critical to our reopening plan and that is centered around the values that you will see in the broad report regarding uh, needing emotional support because of the isolation uh, from stay at home, uh, being uh, staying at home over the last several months. Understanding that staff and students and families all will need additional support and we need to be ready to deliver. We also recognize that we, uh, incredible work uh, that has already started on cultural diversity. And so I'll share a little bit about that in a moment. But component number three could have been just part of component number two, which is your curriculum and instruction, right? This is part of the curriculum is uh, cultural diversity and social emotional learning. That's, that's curricular in nature. However, we recognize that this is such a critical component. We pulled it out and we wanted it to be one of its own components so that it gets the attention and support that it deserves. So first and foremost, we will start uh, uh, with a sense of urgency and immediacy where we will train all of our administrators at the KUMA retreat. Now KUMA, for many of you are saying, well, what is that uh, crazy acronym? KUMA means Capistrano Unified Management Association. That means every single manager across the district comes together before our teachers return and we have several days of professional development and training. Uh, one of the key trainings for all of our managers will be on signs of trauma, being able to recognize signs of trauma in our staff, as well as in our students and our families, and then what strategies are available uh, to, to provide support for our managers to support their staff, to support their teachers, and to support all staff members. Then trainings will be ready to go for our teachers in August. And those, those will be, um, again, building on the great successes of our amazing school counselors. But now that every teacher is trained to understand how to integrate uh, strategies of emotional support and tie into the social emotional learning that the counselors are already delivering through their curriculum. So all teachers will have that training in August. And then finally for our parents, and again, speaking as a, as a capo parent, as much as, as a district employee, we parents also need ideas and support on how do we how do we talk to our kids, how do we support our student our children um, as we as we return to school, 
And so as happened last year, uh, there were webinars by our counselors on a monthly basis. We are committed to continuing those webinars every single month so that parents can have strategies as well. And then cultural diversity. There, uh, the board directed us in the fall, directed uh, the educational services department to, do, to begin work with a cultural proficiency task force. And this is a task force that has approximately 44 members on it, representing uh, um, all different positions and uh, uh, employee groups in our district. And this group came together to begin the work all year long on inclusivity and awareness. What can we do to reinforce, to reinforce the work that we know is so critical for our students, our families, and our staff. So their work this past year is informing training that will start for our administrators in the fall. We are excited to share also that uh, the community and our board will, will have a board workshop in the fall as soon as we are able to come back together face to face to have a board workshop uh, regarding cultural, the cultural proficiency task force where we'll go more in depth into this as well as our social emotional learning multi-year plan. But uh, as part of reopening, you can see a very significant focus in component number three on meeting these emotional needs and the uh, cultural diversity needs of our district. And now uh, Josh Hill and I are very uh, excited to share with you component number four as well. And I know many of you, uh, you know, well, what is it gonna look like? What does it look like when we reopen schools? And so as you can see there in the heading, the, uh, the idea based on the values of our community is we need innovation, we need flexibility. We need flexibility and multiple options to consider because of the ever-changing, ever-fluid, um, the, the very fluid, the very the fluid nature of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as the state reopens, as counties reopen, we understand that our ability to reopen is impacted. And so we must have a flexible plan with flexible programs that can allow our students to learn and thrive in multiple environments. First and foremost, option number one. When stage four is achieved uh, as a state, and then our county is able to reopen with minimal restrictions. And remember stage four is when you get to that place of large events, large gatherings, et cetera, and the uh, distancing uh, requirements are, um, are loosened. We arrive at stage four, and then we will bring our students back in a traditional format uh, because then regular class sizes are possible. And then that is where we then say we, as soon as we can, when it is when we are allowed to do so, we, we return back to that traditional format. Option number one is not an option right now. It is not an option right now, but we put it out there to say we are ready for that option when, it, when stage four is achieved. Option number two is an option that will be available to all families, all students, all the time. So even when, if and when we return to traditional format, we recognize that some students may not uh, be able to return for multiple reasons. One could be um, health factors, um, or it could be health concerns of a family member. We recognize that families will want the option. Again, a choice is a value in our district. And to have that choice, to be able to continue with that online learning whether we're in a traditional format or well, whether we are in the, uh, the option three um, recommendation. So option two is there as a, as a choice for families, regardless of a traditional format or option three. So that's important for people to remember. Now getting into option three, let me share with you because we recognize uh, the very comprehensive board report. It's comprehensive in nature and with a lot of information in there and a lot of details. So let me see, let me help um, really clarify uh, option three. We have elementary, as you can see in the first bold part, K-5. 
and then we have secondary, 612. For elementary, on-campus learning, 100% of the time at the school of residence. Not on, an, uh, not on a different campus, on the school of residence. For kinder through fifth, 100%, five days a week, full days on campus. How is that accomplished, you ask, when you know that guidelines restrict the size of classrooms? Well, it's where the teacher has the class, has half of her class or his class in the morning and the other half in the afternoon. And while the, while the half is not with the teacher, they are with another staff member for extended learning. So 100% on-campus learning uh, for K-5. For 6 through 12, 50% on-campus learning, meaning 50% of the time they're on campus with a teacher getting direct instruction, and 50% of the time they are online with independent study. We have another slide that will help explain this a little bit more detail, but I just want to kind of paint the, the, the big picture here. So for elementary, five days a week, full day. We, we have that for our families. We all, but in order to accomplish that, again, with smaller class sizes, the teacher is teaching half of the class in the morning and half of the class in the afternoon. Same teacher, same group of 30 students, for example, 15 of the students are with the teacher in the morning, 15 of the students are with the teacher in the afternoon. While those students are not with the teacher, they're with a staff member doing extended learning. And we will get into the details of that in a moment. And then for our six through 12, as you can see, 50% of the time on campus learning and 50% online independent study. And again, this option, option three, is built on the, um, the premise of being at their school of residence, knowing that that is a value to get back to normal as much as we possibly can. Being on the school of residence is that, is that very important value to our community. So as we, we will now let me share a little bit more about what extended learning and flipped classroom is. And I'm actually going to, because you're probably getting tired of my voice, I'm going to uh, ask, uh, Josh to uh, give a quick description of extended learning and flipped classroom, two concepts that you saw here. You're probably wondering, well, what is a flipped classroom and what is extended learning? And so Josh Hill will share just briefly with you on those and then we'll show you a couple models to help further explain uh, your choices in option three. Thank you, Dr. Merwin. So as Dr. Merwin referenced, when a student participates in a full day option at an elementary school campus, when they are not with the teacher, we are putting them in a learning environment that we're calling an extended learning environment. Uh, that recognizes that they're not with their classroom teacher during that time. And so they're engaged in other learning activities. So those learning activities can vary and they will vary based on um, the staff at the particular school and the programming that's offered through those staff members. But let me share with you some ideas that we've discussed, keeping in mind that all of this is still um, in the planning stages and, and is liable to change based on feedback and actual staff availability as we get further into this process. But the current thinking is that for part of the time, a student could potentially be engaging in physical education activities with a credentialed PE teacher, perhaps an art activity or a music activity. Um, they could also be working on some of the work that they are doing um, for their class that is more independent learning. I'll talk about that flip model in one minute here. But when they're not with their teacher, there's still significant learning that needs to be done. And it could be with a staff member who is um, overseeing that work. So the idea is kids continue to remain engaged in learning activities when they're not with their teacher um, and they're on school campuses. And then we provide um, instructional settings that are appropriate for that to occur. Um, like Dr. Merwin referenced earlier, it could look different from site to site, just depending on space availability, 
staff availability, but the the idea is that we continue to keep kids engaged and um, in enriching learning opportunities so that they have a very positive experience coming back to school and being able to, to re-engage. They may not be with students in the same grade level. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be the same class of students. So that would all be worked out as we actually divide students uh, based on interest in this program. The flipped classroom model recognizes that when a student is not with a teacher, they're still expected to learn. So only 50% of the time is spent with an actual classroom teacher, their actual classroom teacher. The other 50% um, is done in an independent setting. So a flipped model in its most basic terms is simply where students do some of the learning on their own and then they come to school to build on that learning. So the traditional approach in most of our schools related to homework is students engage in what we call independent practice. So they learn a concept or skill, they work with it um, through guided practice activity with their classroom teacher, and then they go home and the intent is they're prepared to do that work on their own. Now I'm a parent too, and like many of you, I know that sometimes um, that's not what happens. Uh, you're scratching your head thinking, didn't the teacher teach them this? And that's just our reality sometimes. But the idea is they've already learned it. Now they're just practicing with it. A flipped classroom actually does flip that process where they are engaging with the learning independently. And then when they come to class, they're participating with the teacher on a more focused effort toward uh, fundamentals, um, literacy, numeracy in the elementary settings, and then encouraging um, interaction content with other students um, at all levels, but especially in the secondary levels where we're building on group work and projects and some of those approaches. So they do some of what we would consider the more depth of knowledge one and two level activities, which are introductory activities, um, students reading or writing to learn information, watching videos, um, seeing teachers um, who have recorded themselves demonstrating concepts at home, and then when they come to class, building on that base knowledge, engaging in the more um, rigorous depth of knowledge three and four activities, where they're actually getting, um, delving into deeper levels of, of the learning activity. So these activities, this flipped model, is intended to be done independently by students. And so the curriculum that's being developed is being developed with that end in mind. Um, this is not an expectation that teacher or that parents are stepping in and teaching 50% of the curriculum. Um, it is that students are being supported and activities are developed in such a way that students can access them on their own um, before they come back to class. Does that mean that everything will go perfectly, that a student might not have a technical issue with an activity or not understand something clearly? No, we know that will still happen and we'll be working with students to support them and help with those. But the flipped model does put some of the impetus for learning on the student in an independent setting. And then that is built upon the next day when they come back and work with the teacher and get into deeper, more interactive um, activities that extend and, and um, enable the learning to go further. Josh, thank you. So that's a little bit about extended learning and flipped classroom. And I think now if we look at it in the context of a sample schedule, a couple of sample schedules, then we I can help clarify even further. So I'm now uh, sharing with you an elementary school. And let me point out to you, first of all, this, this again is option three, which is what our recommendation will be uh, to the board based on our current um, uh, state guidelines. But option three has within for elementary, K-5, remember 100% of the day, five days a week on campus is, the, is, our, is part of this plan. But notice that we also know that families have, families value choice. And so let me show you how families have choice within this model. So first of all, you can see there's a full day, you can see cohorts A, B, C, D, and E along the top. And you can see that there is a full day option that is cohort A and B, a half day option, cohorts C and D. And then that third choice, 
is online. So again, think of them as three choices. Choice one, full day. Choice two, half day. Choice three, 100% online. So as, uh, as uh, Josh was sharing with you regarding the extended learning time, now if you look at it in context of the day, that you have, this says teach the supervisor one and teacher one. So this is a staff member and a teacher. They are working with one group of 30 students, 30 to 32 students. Half of the students are with the teacher in the morning for two and a half hours of instruction. That's cohort B. The other half is with that staff member, that paraeducator, and other uh, certificated staff that are doing extended learning. They then, you can see, have a transition, they have lunch, and then they swap. So now the teacher's other half of the class that was, in, was with the supervisor in the morning is now with the teacher in the afternoon. That's cohort A. And the group that was with the teacher in the morning getting that direct instruction is now with the staff member, and that's cohort B. So again, this is one teacher with 30 to 32 students or the regular size classroom, but that class is cut is not is uh, separated into two cohorts, cohort A and cohort B. And these times I want to point out, and uh, Josh will point out too as we look at the secondary, these are approximate. These are going to, this plan is still being developed. As I mentioned, these, these very large, uh, diverse uh, uh, reopening teams with all the experts across the district figuring out these details. Uh, so please don't, don't fixate on 745 to 8. Well, how, how's the 745 to 8 going to work? Well, that's an approximate um, window to say if we needed to do a staggered arrival, we would set up a staggered arrivals for, dip for our students to allow them um, that window. We want to point out that depending on guidelines, when we get to July 15th, and as we're doing a final plan, the final plan is in place, that we may not need staggered arrival. It may not be needed. So we are just planning in case we need to have different arrival times for students to avoid large gatherings. So I just want to point that out to you that this is all approximate. These timelines are approximate and the details are still being worked on. So now here is one choice for a family, the full day option. Now the other choice, the second choice is a half day option because we recognize that some families may choose to only have the direct instruction with the teacher and then to be working independently online for the second part of the day. So instead of staying for extended learning, if it's cohort C, or arriving to, a, to that in independent study time, uh, that, that extended learning in cohort D, it's just for the direct instruction, and that is the only time that the child is on campus. This is a choice that families will have. Now, I want to say right up front that we are not saying that families will uh, have the choice to say, oh, you know, AM will work great in my schedule, but PM won't. Now, as a parent, I get that. I understand the challenges of uh, working and of um, you know, the AM versus the PM and one is more convenient than, other, than the other, but because that the school staffing of these will be so intricate and complex, we simply cannot, um, we cannot build it on just uh, parent requests. So we please know that that will be part of this and that we just simply can't do that logistically. So, but this is a choice for families. They could choose to have uh, a half day option with the other half of the day being independent study online. And then the final choice would be 100% online. As I mentioned, that is, the, that is the choice that is available even when we return to traditional format. So now I'm going to ask uh, Josh to share a little, a little bit about what the uh, what it looks for it looks like for our grades six through twelve with this fifty percent on campus fifty percent online. Thank you again, Dr. Merwin. And the short answer is it looks blurry, so we apologize for that. It's, it's bigger than it was when we created it. Um, so what you're seeing here is a typical block schedule, 
and it could be used on a middle or a high school campus. As Dr. Merwin mentioned, um, all of this is still a work in progress. Uh, we've shared this information with our principals and they're currently working on um, specific um, implementations of this and what it could look like. And already this is you know, evolving. So just please be patient with us as we go through this process. But I wanted to talk at least conceptually about the, the model here. So again, using that flipped model, kids are on campus um, as much as 50% of the time. And what you see here is from the student view. So if I was a student and I had six, let's say six classes or five classes on a campus, um, my schedule would look something like this, except that I would be on either one or the other, A or B track. So like our current high schools operate, four days a week is a block schedule and the other day currently is a traditional schedule. And that day can be utilized differently as well. It could be a traditional day, it could be another block day where you have a rolling block. Um, it could move to a different day of the week. It could be a day where we just focus on students who need additional intervention or support um, because they, they struggled during distance learning um, in the spring and we need to wrap our arms even more securely around them to help them. Um, it could be a day that is um, an at-home day for, for students. So there's different ways that we could utilize that. But what we've done right now is we've gone for the 50% model and shown what it would look like having a combination of traditional and block block days. So in the block day, you're on either an A or B track. That means you would come to school on this schedule, either Monday, Wednesday, and every other Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and every other Friday. Again, there's, there's a possibility to move that traditional day to a Wednesday, to a Monday. Um, it can be set up differently, and we're looking at different iterations of that. Now, you would only attend each class one and a half times a week or two times every other week, depending on how you, how you look at it. So if I was on a track, then I would attend my first period class on Monday and Friday. If I was on B track, I would attend my first period class on Monday and then the next Friday utilizing this schedule. Again, there's different ways to, to have it work out. So without getting too complicated, that's the general idea here. But students would still take the same number of classes they would normally take. Um, there's options possibly to, to do things a little bit differently, um, to maybe have additional time built in here to study, um, to work on a course. One thing that Dr. Merwin mentioned that I want to highlight again, um, this does not show 100% option, but that is still an option. And the reality is some of our courses may not be available online, um, but we also might have the ability to put more courses online if we can have some flexibility. So possibly allowing a student to take a class online um, at their school and do the others on campus. So we're trying to find ways, as he mentioned, to meet that community value of flexibility, but continuing to offer full educational programming. We're just not sure exactly which courses will be, will be available. And so our guidance assistant principals at the high school are working on that right now. I met with them earlier this morning and we're in the midst of, of wrestling with these issues and seeing what is possible. But I just wanted to show that, that there's flexibility and potential to do some really creative things with this approach um, in a way that really personalizes the learning for each student um, and still gives them access to the full programming that we offer. Um, just thinking about different ways of, of meeting that need and accomplishing that. So that's briefly the AB track, the block schedule, the traditional model. Again, there are different ways this can be rolled out, um, but that's the general thinking. Now this, as Dr. Merwin cautioned earlier too, please don't um, overreact to this. Our, our sites did when they saw this. And as we processed it, we realized too that a lot of these plans were, were developed with earlier guidance that we had received. Um, we only received the guidance from the State Department of Public Health a little over um, a week and a half ago. Um, so a lot of this we were doing kind of in the blind, limited to what had been published by the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control. So that new guidance has helped us think about this in, in new and different ways. And as he referenced, um, there could be more guidance coming specifically from our county healthcare agency. So that being said, we wrestled with what a staggered schedule could look like. And again, none of these times have been vetted or even developed with um, the regular school day in mind. This was just free thinking around some of these topics. But we share it with you to show that there was still a way to capture our traditional programming in a, in a staggered approach if necessary. It creates additional complications that now we think might not be necessary. Um, in fact, the staggered approach we, we believe can be accommodated simply by providing greater flexibility 
in when students take classes and where they take classes. So this staggered approach may not even at the end be, be necessary, but we still thought through it and looked at it as a model we could fall back on if necessary. And we even were creative enough to do this with the 8.30 start time in mind that high school students will have in about two years. Um, and when you start looking at kids getting out of class around four or five in the afternoon, you know, we're all scratching our heads thinking, oh my goodness, what is the world coming to? But at the end of the day, we did our thinking around this and just wanted to share it with you in, in evidence of that and to, sh and to show you that there are ways to do this. There are ways to return to normal. It just takes creative approaches um, and then opportunities like this to process information publicly, to get your feedback and questions, to look at things differently. So I am personally very appreciative of this opportunity to think out loud in front of so many people and then very, very interested in the feedback and questions that come out of this, because that's often where some of the best ideas come from. Um, so Dr. Merwin, that's just a brief overview of, of that secondary option. Um, not as much about the 100% online, but know that's still an opportunity here. And then increased flexibility possibly for, for more online um, cor course availability if necessary. And I do think it opens up more flexibility for us as a district as a whole. So pretty exciting to think about what this could look like in the fall. And um, really looking forward to, to you know, getting plans down on paper and working with families on selecting the classes for next year, um, if any of those options need to be rethought. So back to you, Dr. Merman. Thank you, Josh. And let me, uh, let me make sure that I, I'm very clear on uh, going back to the elementary. Let me bring it back. That's uh, just so that we're clear that when we, if a family were to choose a half day model, we will be working with school sites to absolutely hear the choice of an AM or a PM, but cannot guarantee that that would be available based on staffing limitations. So I just do want that. I don't want any of our um, community or parents to feel like we wouldn't, we wouldn't listen and we wouldn't want to know what your preference would be, but there are limitations to staffing where we can't always guarantee if you were to choose the half day model that it could be provided to you with the, the, the session you wanted. So just wanna make sure we double back and make that clear that obviously we know the strong value and as a parent, I do too, we wanna to be heard. We want to know what would be uh, our preference and then schools would work to do that whenever possible. So um, we realize moving forward that uh, communication is critical and we have such a, a stellar communications department uh, that Ryan Burris leads uh, that's, that works tirelessly to communicate with our families and our community. And uh, we want you to know that we are um, absolutely committed to ongoing communication um, for as we move forward into the July 15th board meeting for our final plan, as well as uh, moving towards opening day. And so we will be starting a reopening schools website that'll be found on the front page of the uh, district website that you can click on similar to the COVID-19 website that you have access to now, where you'll have all, all archived messages, uh, links to COVID-19 information, links to guidelines like the California Department of Public Health, et cetera. Uh, all of that will be available to you on the website and that will be up shortly. We will also have reopening weekly messaging for families and for staff. So understanding you've seen multiple messages coming out every week, uh, we will continue to provide at least a weekly message to give you updates on progress and on any changes in guidelines, et cetera. That will be available for families and then a little different message for our staff with some more detail on, on their, uh, their needs at their school sites. We will also provide a reopening guide. So it will be a document that captures our plan that's, that is approved by the board in July and it will be put into a kind of a family friend, friendly format and also a version for staff so that they can clearly see um, how, you know, the, the program options, the mental health, the, um, the health and safety and the curriculum instruction pieces. We are also realizing that we want to uh, reach out to all families uh, to ask for an early registration, to, to put out to you, if, if we are directed by the board to do so, to uh, 
put out to all of you an early registration uh, form and ask you to choose one of the options to choose the option and to choose the variation within that option that best meets your needs. And uh, so we will be asking that of you, again, based on board direction. Uh, and we will be basically wanting that early registration so we can begin uh, final preparations and staffing and all the facilities needs, understanding the, the, uh, the parent demands and parent requests um, for what type of program. And then finally, we will confirm with our families um, as we get closer to August. So the early registration, as you'll see on the next slide, uh, would happen very shortly. And then there would be a confirmation with all families uh, towards the end of July to just confirm that that is still, that's your final, quote unquote, your final answer on your, um, on your selection for program. And then that will allow us then do our work to be ready to reopen successfully on August 18th. And so the final slide we leave you with is the, uh, the timeline. And again, tomorrow night is our board meeting. We're very excited to, uh, to do a public presentation of the reopening plan. Uh, then with that, uh, with that direction, if we have direction from the board, we will ask for a registration from families around those, uh, those choices. We will then have the uh, special session board meeting June 24th, where staff will recommend, we make a recommendation to trustees regarding the curriculum uh, plan for online and for next year. We then come back together again in July, uh, July 15th for the regularly scheduled board meeting as for, to present uh, with all those other details and all those questions answered and all of those things figured out based on the guidelines at the time to then ask for final approval of the plan. We then will, as I mentioned, confirm registration with all families to say, okay, you made your early registration at the end of June. We're confirming your registration for your program choice. Uh, at the end of July, we then do can do our final preparations uh, preparing for opening day, which is August 18th. And then finally, we come together August 19th uh, with a report to the board on implementation. And so that is, uh, that is the uh, conclusion of the PowerPoint presentation that you will be seeing again for those of you that join us again tomorrow night. Uh, and I will stop sharing my screen and uh, bring it back to uh, Ryan Burris as we uh, finish up our time together. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Josh. I think one of the important things, um, just even looking in the, in the question and answer that's coming through is just trying to help parents understand the budget, what that looks like. The fact that we can't just open normally, believe me, ideally, I think we would. We would be on summer vacation, probably many of us at this point, but that's not an option. Um, we, we have to open within the phases of the governor's reopening plan and we have to follow the health and safety guidelines that are put forward for us. Um, as, as Greg stated early on in the presentation, we are required as a public entity to um, provide a specific standard level of care for our students. And absent that standard of care, we could actually put the district and our taxpayers into huge liability if someone were to get sick or to die. And so there is a standard of care, regardless of what we're doing, not just during this current pandemic, but whether we're opening schools in a normal year or whatever that looks like, there's always a standard of care that we're following, and it is in this case too. Again, not ideal, and, and certainly not under the funding that we receive. Um, if we wanted to do this in a big way, $27 million would be the cost to hire the amount of teachers that we need. And so I guess that's where I'd like to start with just a little bit more explanation about what that looks like, especially for elementary kids, um, the number of hours a day that they would have a teacher and then what the professional staff looks like who would be supporting them while we are also working to support families who work. That was a value of the board and many families is dual incomes and they have to work. So where are their kids during the day? So can we explain a little bit more of what that looks like for families and their kids in elementary?
So Ryan, can you, can you go ahead and uh, clarify one more time? Sure. The question? So a lot of parents asking if, if kids are only seeing teachers for a certain part of the day, where are the kids the rest of the day? What kind of professionals are with them? What kind of people, what does that look like so that they understand what the teaching and learning model looks like in an elementary school? Okay, yeah. So that uh, as we as we shared in the in the um, in the model, the in the visual that there is a staff member uh, primarily will be a paraeducator uh, who will be uh, be the lead person with that extended learning, and then we will have other uh, certificated teachers, other certificated staff, such as uh, you know that'll offer that those different elective type options. Uh, and as, as uh, Josh mentioned, it, it may differ uh, slightly from school to school, but those could include such as art, structured PE, music, uh, counselors. We would be looking at ways that, you know, during that extended learning, counselors could provide um, second step lessons and group lessons. We could be looking at social skills, uh, structured recess those types of things would be uh, part of the extended learning time. And again, the paraeducator, um, many of you may not be familiar with what that term means. That means like some people know it as an IA or, uh, or an aide, but they, are, they would be uh, supported and trained and they would be under the direction of the teacher. So the classroom teacher would be working with the paraeducator to make sure there was that alignment in that flipped classroom concept that Josh shared. Okay. And another question, will middle school be moving to high school? Uh, that, I'm glad somebody brought that up. Thank you. Yes, we, uh, we obviously have been brainstorming all sorts of different options for, for some time now and I've uh, got great feedback from parents and staff and, uh, and one of the values right away was uh, to be on, to feel normal, as normal as possible. And so that is the uh, being on your school of residence, your where you, if you are, I'm thinking of George White, where my kids went, you know, it's George White is your school of residence, that's where you would be, not at Miguel Hills Middle School. And if your um, child, my children at Miguel Hills, instead of being at Dana Hills, they're at Miguel Hills, their school of residence. So it is built on that foundational value of that sense of normalcy and connectedness to uh, keep our students on their school of residence. We don't want to say home campus, but it's really, it's really their, their, their school of residence. And would their school of residence also be if they have a, a school of choice option, would that remain? That is their school of residence. All right. Um, what about, what, what, how do we accommodate kids in a virtual or hybrid model with um, 504s or IEPs? So that is done on a on a case by case basis. The IEP team working closely with the family uh, to you know again if a if a family that had a student with an IEP a child with an IEP and they wanted they chose 100% online, then they would have that IEP meeting and then they would uh, discuss together the related services and the other services that would be provided virtually online. Uh, 504 you have 504 coordinators at every school and so if a family selected the online option, uh, then there would be that conversation with the 504 coordinator to talk about how those uh, those accommodations was, would be accomplished. Obviously, in an online um, in an online environment, if an accommodation is uh, sitting closely uh, or a seating arrangement close to the teacher, that's obviously in a 100% online environment. That's going to look different, and so those would be the things that would be discussed. Uh, in those in those meetings individually on a case by case basis. Okay, and then what about um, TBIC or special ed classes? How will that be accommodated? Very excited to to share with everyone that uh, our specialized programs um, for our students with IEPs that their class sizes are already at levels of 8, 10, 12, 14 to 15 and would very, uh, very much uh, um, be uh, suitable and appropriate for the distancing um, requirements and guidelines from the California Department of Public Health. And so therefore, our plan is to have them come back full-time five days a week 
uh, because again, the distancing requirements can be met because they're already in a smaller class environment. Okay. And then um, is there anything specific you can give in as far as details for dual immersion schools? And programs. Um, we would just like to share that we are working with uh, two-way immersion teachers to develop uh, those uh, those great online options and online curriculum for our two-way and our Mandarin immersion. So uh, we recognize that that needs that that needs to be done, and we're working with our experts to do that. Okay. As far as um, a distance learning model, will that be available to families from each school site? 100% distance learning? So our goal in this plan is to make sure that families feel connected to their school so that they can choose 100% online and be, still be at George White, to still be at Miguel Hills, to still be a part of that, part of that school experience, you know, the, the, um, the messaging, the, to feel that connectedness. So that is the goal to have that 100% online uh, option at every single school site. And, and uh, it will obviously be part of, we will take our uh, early registration numbers from our families and then see, uh, we have to have, of course, just like any other enrollment, uh, we have the enrollment for that class, for that online class, we then are able to offer it there. Uh, we will be able to share more with the board in the final plan July 15th, once we have that early registration numbers. But it is, again, our goal that that 100% online is, is helping our chi the child feel connected to their school and it's offered by that school. Okay. And then I just want to clarify one more time because parents are still asking, will Ladera Ranch middle schoolers be at San Juan Hills High School? So again, knowing, recognizing, thank you for bringing it up again, Ryan, because we can't emphasize this enough. This is a very important value for our community and for capital parents, including myself, uh, all that we want our families at, we want our students and our families at their school of residence. So if Ladera Ranch Middle School is their school of residence, that is where they would attend. They would not attend the high school as an eighth grader. They would not attend their high school as a seventh grader. They attend their middle school. Ladera Ranch Elementary uh, fourth grader attends school at Ladera Ranch Elementary School, if that is their school of residence. So that is a strong value in our community. And that is that why was, the plan addresses that. That was originally a model we looked at very early on. And right. um, it was one that based on parent feedback and, and re-looking at models and talking with staff too, that we figured out a way to make sure that kids stayed at the school that they were registered. Um, what are plans for theater, choir departments, physical education, extracurricular? Josh, do you want, you to, want uh, me to jump in, Greg? Yeah, yeah I feel bad. You're doing all the talking here, and I <laughs> can certainly help out with some of this. Thanks, Josh. Um, so currently, we have a commitment to continuing to provide pathways for students to get a comprehensive experience um, through middle school, high school, starting elementary school. And obviously, there are some restraints, and we're working through those. Our commitment is to continue to provide those opportunities for students. So we would maintain our, um, our arts programming, um, athletic programming, um, and all of those things. Now, as I, as I mentioned, you know, there could be a, a disruption um, periodically so that we can ensure that we're offering programming at certain locations. You know, maybe we have a physical education teacher come to an elementary school and work with students um, in that extended learning environment. Well, obviously that person's not at the other school working um, with those students. So there could be um, changes like that, but we're really working on kind of an all hands on deck model next year and making sure that we have the support in place for our youngest and most vulnerable students to be somewhere where they can be learning all day, every day, um, building and, and planting the seeds for, for those um, skills and concepts that we want to help them develop and nurture over the years. So that's something that we'll be committing to, to continue to sustain and support. Um, of course, there could be, as I said, um, small modifications here and there, but where we might not be able to offer something at one site, one of the things we're discussing right now is, can we offer it online at another site? And then a student could still participate in that program um, online or in a different kind of a setting. So we are really trying to look at the district as a whole in some of this programming, where we might be restrained at a certain site. Is there something we can do somewhere else? 
to support kids. One of our advantages is we have so many schools that we have a lot more um, that we can draw upon to meet some of these unique needs. And I just want to mention too and highlight um, that we are very sensitive and um, focused right now on developing what programming will look like for um, some of our other vulnerable student groups. So students with IEPs, um, students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, students who are English learners. And so we're continuing to work on ways to help provide additional support and time for those individual students. Um, of course, as Dr. Merwin referenced earlier, um, every IEP, every 504 plan is unique. And so we work within that um, uniqueness to provide that service for students. Um, but we have had many, multiple conversations with different creative ways to approach it from um, providing some pull-out services if necessary during extended learning time if students are only on campus for part of the time, looking at virtual options in some situations, looking at ways to bring students back if class sizes are small enough, both at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, regardless of whether it's a very specialized program like a behavior program or steps program, or maybe just a program that is um, a directed class. If it's a small enough group of kids and we can have them there every day, why not do that? So we are really thinking in terms of um, layering that support on for our most vulnerable students, both by age and by need, and then looking at ways to have as much support, as much contact with teachers and staff as possible to meet those needs. Okay, and then can we talk a little bit about high school sports? High school sports, we can't wait till we have them. Um, I can't wait till we have them. Maybe some people can wait. I don't know. I can't wait. And so we are um, watching very closely the developments. Um, the uh, CIS governance has put out limited information right now. Um, we are also looking at um, National High School Federation um, guidance that has been provided, uh, which often provides guidance to groups like CIS and to safe ways to bringing kids back. So we're, we're looking at a phased in approach. And right now what that would entail is for some of those um, sports, starting with conditioning in small groups, maintaining distancing. Obviously you can't do some things um, with the current uh, guidelines that have been offered um, that you could normally do. Students can't pass balls back and forth, but they can still exercise. They can still do the conditioning portion of it. Um, we hope that there will be a time when limited um, contests can be reintroduced and maybe some sports can start earlier than others. A sport that doesn't require as much contact um, might be able to come back before another. There could be limitations on crowd size and gatherings. We might be having these competitions without audiences in some cases. And then as, as things are safe to do so and um, things open up a little bit more, we could introduce certain sports back. Um, contact sports as well as, as larger gatherings. So it's going to be a phased approach that will be responsive to the guidance that is in place at the time. And based on the current guidance, um, we're looking at having some sports start conditioning again um, in, the, in the beginning of July. Um, so CIF does require a summer dead period. It's what they call it, where students aren't able to exercise or participate in athletics. And we've declared the month of June to be that time period. We would start a, a very, um, phased in reintroduction with conditioning um, coming back in, in July and then building out as conditions warrant. Okay. And as we're still talking about high school, what about zero period? And what about classes like AP? So we're, we're working to keep as much current programming in place as possible. That doesn't mean we'll be able to keep everything in place. Like I mentioned, we're looking at other options too. If we can offer a course, Maybe um, because it's, uh, it's not enough kids in it, maybe we could do it online and open that up to kids at other schools who might not have access to that course. Now, regarding will there, how many zero, it's not a matter of will there be zero period. Yes, there will be zero period. It's how many classes will be available. And that's something that we're going to be um, refining as we get more information from the community. So uh, Dr. Merwin referenced the, um, the registration process Understanding how many families would like a 100% online model will help us understand how many students we'll have in the face-to-face -face model. And then that will dictate how many periods we can offer of different courses. So unfortunately, so much of what we're doing now is conceptual and theoretical. We're building out the practical portions as we can. And some of that data just isn't available to us right now. So we're very much looking forward to having more information 
um, based on parent and um, family interests as we as we move into the um, summer again, assuming that trustees um, approve our plan and, and that this is the direction that we decide to go. Okay, thanks, Josh. I'll try to ask a couple more questions. Um, if there's any that you see popping up more and more that you guys want to answer, just let me know. Ryan, may I may I jump in and just say too that we uh, we are already recognized that we would love to come back together again in a you know either it's a webinar forum or something like this is so helpful but uh, not in, so I think we're we're certainly all uh, willing and able and ready to do that so that we can reconnect with uh, with our families but also specifically to special education. So I would be happy to work with our community advisory committee leaders and also just in general to offer a series of uh, special education specific webinars um, as we you know, move into the summer to, to give families options to, to ask more detailed questions around that. So uh, please know everybody that's here tonight that that would be, um, be our commitment and my team and I would, uh, would love to connect specifically on all the special education questions so we can go more in detail on that, uh, maybe in a separate venue. Okay, <clears throat> and this may have been covered, but when parents decide which track they're gonna take, how long are they committed to that? Do we know yet? So we are, that is one of the, that's one of the details that we have our logistics team um, working on. And we, we recognize that we wanna balance between, you know, we can't just uh, have constant change uh, from uh, program to program choice because of staffing implications and facilities implications. Uh, but we also recognize that we want families to be able to have that flexibility to say, okay, at first I thought this, but now I'm ready to, to uh, shift into a different program you know, choice. And so we will have that clearly defined for, uh, for families and we'll share that in the July 15th uh, final plan to the board but we recognize there will be these interim point checkpoints where families could make that change. Okay. Ryan, I had a question there quite a few times, and I think we referenced it earlier about students, siblings at different schools, same tracks. I just wanna reemphasize that, that we, are, we, we would do everything we could to try to um, maintain that um, because we recognize the demands on families. Um, there may be maybe situations where we can't exactly get the alphabetic breakdown to be the same at every school. Um, but those are the kind of conversations we've had with our school administrators as they've started wrapping their minds around this. Um, and then we would hope that families would be comfortable if something is missed or it doesn't work out, um, bringing that information forward to um, an assistant principal or a principal, because it may just be a matter of, oh yeah, there is room in that. It didn't work out perfectly at our school, but we can make that, make that switch happen here and there. Um, we probably can't promise that it will be perfect for every family um, and that access would be available to every program that way. Um, but we're doing our best to, to balance programming with actual needs of families, um, understanding that it's so much easier if, well, for one, on the day that maybe your 12-year-old is home, that their 16-year-old sibling is there with them at home. So we, we recognize those kinds of, of needs um, and would, would work to support families in that process with the with the understanding that it may not work out in every situation. Okay. And with that, I wanna thank all of, um, all of our executive cabinet today um, for being here and um, for taking the time to do this. I know it's really important. We got a lot of great questions from families that we will continue to follow up on. So if we didn't get to all of them today, please know that um, we'll be taking a copy of the questions that we got in the Q&A in the chat and adding them to an FAQ that we'll be putting online. Um, we are committed to doing more of these throughout the summer. We should have a, a better idea of exactly what this plan looks like moving forward after July 15th. So once the board votes um, and you know after the discussion tomorrow night and then the time we have over the next month to really put a, a, a very rigorous plan together, this, the board will again meet to discuss and to vote on it. And then we will move forward from July 15th to put a strong plan in place for reopening on August 18th. So we will have more of these meetings. Um, we will be supporting our families a lot more in exactly what this looks like moving forward. 
Again, as far as the, the specific health and safety guidelines, social distancing, what recess, what lunch would look like, we will not make any of those decisions until probably sometime in August because the guidelines change sometimes daily and weekly, and we still have two months to go. So I did share the, the link in the chat and in the question and answer to the document that we're using, and I shared it in an email last week to families. It's from the California Department of Public Health School and School-Based Programs Guidance. It's available online. Um, I'm happy to share it again. And we did record this webinar, so it, it will take me a while to actually to um, finalize and produce it and get it posted. But my goal would be to do it and have it ready for families to review. Um, it'll probably be closer to lunchtime tomorrow. It takes me about 10 hours to do. Um, I'll put the links in there when we send it out to families, just so you have it again. And um, I would just recommend that you review that as you know what we're using to sort of plan the guidelines for August 18th. Any last minute comments from any of our panelists? Okay, and with that, again, I thank you all for being here. We appreciate your time and we look forward to the discussion we'll be having tomorrow night with our board and with our public. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here.